If you are pregnant or you've recently had a baby, this podcast is for you. I am your host, Kath Bequee, a physiotherapist working in women's health and mum of three. Inside my online program, Fitness Mama, I just love helping support women to care for their bodies during pregnancy, prepare their bodies for birth and support their after birth recovery, helping them feel confident and strong inside out during this important stage of their lives. In this podcast, join me each week as we dive into all things pregnancy care, childbirth and postnatal recovery, helping you through every step of the journey. It is absolutely possible to feel amazing and confident in our bodies during this motherhood journey, and I want that for you. Come and say hi to me on Instagram at fitnessmama, and let's dive into today's episode. Hello, and welcome back to the Pregnancy, Birth and Recovery podcast. Today, I am chatting with a fertility dietitian all about preconception nutrition. So we're discussing the importance of the first 1,000 days of nutrition, preconception planning, and tips for diet for both partners while conceiving. So Mariam really does discuss the importance of diet in preconception beyond fertility as well. So the impact it has on pregnancy health and the health outcomes for the future child. So in today's episode, we discuss how a dietitian nutritionist can help with fertility, what does a dietitian do uh, with infertility, and, and what is the optimal fertility diet. And Mariam also suggests some really great foods that are perfect for fertility for both females and males. So as I mentioned, Mariam is an accredited practicing dietitian and certified fertility dietitian. She is passionate about helping women gain relief from women's health conditions like PCOS and supporting women's and couples to optimize their diet and lifestyle to support their fertility and preconception health. She knows the power of nutrition and lifestyle and how it can absolutely shape not only a couple's chance of falling pregnant, but also being able to support the health of their future child for life. She runs her virtual practice, Tayeb Nutrition, in Sydney, Australia, where she supports clients one-to-one and all around the world, as well as delivering a variety of supports to educate and inform the community at large through her webinars and her social media. I'll put all of Mariam's links in the show notes and let's get right into it. Mariam, thank you so much for joining me on today's podcast. I'm super excited to chat all things fertility diet, optimizing our health before pregnancy and, you know, what are the good foods to eat? Like all these really important questions before someone actually gets pregnant. So thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Catherine. I'm so excited to jump on and share some knowledge for anyone listening in. How did you get into this area of work? Yeah, um, great question. So I think it kind of just happened organically. So I think toward, you know, during my degree, um, I think one of the key moments that made me really interested in this area is learning because pretty early on in my undergrad, actually, about what we call the first 1,000 days. So this is the body of research which shows that what, um, I guess, a couple's health before they fall pregnant and during, and I guess, a woman's health and diet during pregnancy can have a really key role in shaping the future health outcomes of their future child. Um, and yeah, when I found out about this, I thought, wow, this is super interesting. Um, and then towards, I guess, the labor of my degree, I realized, Hey, you can turn this into a career option. Um, learning more about, I guess, the impact of fertility nutrition. And I think just in my experience, people tend to be actively seeking information about diet and conception when they are struggling with infertility or other women's health related challenges, such as PCOS and endometriosis or thyroid related conditions. Um, so I thought, Hey, this is really cool because I guess when you're targeting this population, we are directly impacting the health of the child, but also learning about the impact of diet and fertility. You know, we can help so many women and couples that are struggling with infertility, which can be such a huge burden to carry. And, and yeah, that's kind of how I fell into it. And I guess I had my own 
um, women's health challenges, which made me super interested in the women's health aspect. So having PCOS myself um, and just seeing how limited the options were provided out there, or even just getting a diagnosis, how challenging it can be. So I definitely saw a huge gap um, in terms of women's health of our support services and um yeah i guess you know i thought it was such a super interesting area and that's what drove me very very long i guess that's a shorthand story but then i obviously did a whole bunch of professional development um into an experience into the area to upskill yeah fantastic so i guess the big question to start off with has diet nutrition in terms of evidence base has it actually been shown to help with fertility yeah, absolutely. So this is definitely a more emerging area of research, but we have some fantastic research that's been conducted, things out of Harvard University showing that couples who, I mean, actually women rather, who, again, just five simple dietary changes can actually improve, uh, reduce time to conception and improve fertility by up to 69%. So maybe, I think that's a huge stat. And for women with PCOS, can, yeah. can I just pause <laughs> you on that? Did you say so five can. simple changes can improve your fertility by how much? 69%. Okay. Yeah, so pretty big stats there. And for women with PCOS, it can be also be up to 80%, which to me, I think it's huge. And I think it's such an undervalued area that women are not being given information before they fall pregnant or while they're on their fertility journeys. Absolutely. My first baby is 11 years old and this was not talked about no. or maybe I was just oblivious to it. There were no podcasts. Back in those uh, days. <laughs> no, and I think a lot of this research maybe was not around back then or was not as publicly or well known. And like you said, the, our access to information at the moment with podcasts and things like that is definitely mm-hmm. um, much more widely accessible. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I'm definitely going to ask you about those five <laughs> changes because no doubt they provide the cornerstone or the foundations of everything right absolutely i feel the key dietary changes to make to support fertility for sure five that sounds really easy and achievable <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it, it really does it look, it look to me as a dietitian i think it's it is but a lot of them like it does require i guess a change in diet so for some people who depending on where your baseline diet is it might require some you know a change in behavior it might require some support but to me i think yeah look con- considering what the return on investment of, the, of these changes i do think they're fairly simple so mm. if we're happy to we can get oh, stuck well into i it. do <laughs> want to get stuck into those five but first so what are the things stopping women from making these changes? Because obviously 69%, I think that's what you said, is, mm. you know, that's an important aspect. Mm. Are women, I guess maybe I'm making that assumption, are women finding it difficult to implement these changes or are women pretty determined by the time they come and see you and want to make mm. some changes mm. with their fertility? Yep. For sure, for sure. Yeah, so that's a great question. Thanks for asking that, Catherine. And um, I think... Yeah, often one of the biggest aspects I find is a lack of awareness. So before women come to see me, they might have done a whole bunch of Googling, looking at Instagram, TikTok for the information and I guess led to uh, made changes that I guess science does not support for improving fertility. And by this stage, you know, they might maybe quite stressed, overwhelmed by different dietary strategies. So I think that's definitely a big factor. Misinformation is a really big uh, factor. Another is time. People are time poor. Um, I guess not everyone, sometimes it's very convenient to lean towards takeout, whether it's for lunch at work or after work. So I think time and energy um, and even like for some people cooking ability or even just wanting to cook in the first place, I think that can make things a lot more tricky. Um, and another, I guess, is, you know, support. I guess if women are, you know, they're already mo- their mothers, they're working, what support are we providing to help people make these changes with diet? And this is where, again, sometimes having enlisting a dietitian um, can be a really big uh, factor that can help because of what changes to make. It's also that accountability and support. So because everyone's different. There isn't, you know, the way I um, provide advice to one person might look very different to someone else. Yeah, totally makes sense. Okay, let's go into it, Mariam. What are the five important aspects to help with sure, fertility? Sure. So the first one is really looking at our fat types. Um, and this one might be, I guess, a surprise to many people. What we found in, I guess, in this Harvard uh, research is 
uh, the, uh, women who reduce the intake of trans fats. So this is looking at those really processed refined fats, what we find in those deep fried foods, the packaged foods, the takeaway foods, um, that uh, replacing those, so reducing those fats, which they actually quite inflammatory. So it can worsen inflammation around things like the egg um, and replacing them with more unsaturated or healthier fats. So this can include things like my favorite fat type is extra virgin olive oil, one of the best, I guess, research oils and great for fertility, avocados, nuts and seeds, um, and also looking at other like seafood, so oily fish and seafood. So they're really great, a really great source of omega-3 fatty acid, which is very anti-inflammatory and fantastic for fertility. That's our first one. Second is having um, a look at, I guess, our proteins. So um, again, in, in a very much Western style diet, I think we have a we're heavy reliant, heavily reliant on many animal proteins. Um, you know, your red meat, chicken, et cetera. And they're fairly easy. But again, in this research, we know that replacing just 20 grams of animal-based protein per day with a plant protein. So that could look like, you know, if you have a tuna salad for lunch, lunch and you throw in some a four bean mix, or if you're making, for example, um, you know, spaghetti bolognese, maybe you replace some of the red meat with some lentils um, or having a meat-free dinner per week, things like that, really simple changes that can actually improve ovulatory fertility by 50%. So another (laughs) whopping stat there. So So is that due to reducing the meat or is that due to just increasing the variety? This episode is brought to you by Baby Bee, Australian owned and designed prams combining quality, safety, and style. Not only does Baby Bee let you try their prams at home with free returns for nine months. Yes, that's nine months. They also offer an industry-leading three-year warranty for total peace of mind. With thousands of five-star reviews, around-the-clock customer care, and up to $300 of free accessories with every pram, what are you waiting for? Go visit www.babybeeonline.com and check them out for yourself. And yes, for listeners of the podcast, there is a 20% discount code. Enter FITBEE, F-I-T-B-E-E 20 at checkout and T's and C's apply. Yeah, look, it's a great question. So it could be a variety of factors here. So when you're thinking about yeah. those animal-based proteins, as we said, those again, those fats we want to limit and avoid. We spoke about trans fats. The other fats that we want to limit for fertility is saturated fats. So a lot of animal-based proteins do naturally have some saturated fats in there, especially if we're thinking about, you know, the fat on um, on meat or the skin on chicken and things like that. So by, replace, by, by re- reducing our, red, uh, our animal-based proteins, we are naturally reducing some of these saturated fats. And I guess beans and legumes and all these plant-based proteins also have a lot of fertility-friendly benefits um, as a standalone. So they contain plenty of folate, which we know is really fantastic for fertility. It contains fiber, which is again, really fantastic to help lower, for things like your gut health, lowering inflammation. Um, and they're also, you know, really satiating and they also a low GI carbohydrate as well. So they a lot of, when we're speaking about beans, they can, t- they provide that plant protein, but it also provides a low GI carbohydrate in there. So it could be a variety of factors, but Again, I think a lot of us in you know Western modern style diet, we're just not getting enough plant based proteins, and these are just seem to be really really good for us. Mm. Yep, some great tips there. Okay, so the first one you mentioned was increasing like olive oils and those oils in your diet that you mm-hmm. mentioned. The second one was reducing, like well, I guess, optimizing your proteins. We're ready to move on. Let's move on. <laughs> Let's move on. Our next, so I've kind of broached on this very briefly when I was speaking about beans. Our next is thinking about our carbohydrates. Um, and it's choosing, you know, your more low GI, slow release carbohydrates rather than, you know, those really highly refined processed carbohydrates, so your white flours, your cakes and pastries, um, as and also avoiding, you know, really low carbohydrate diets. So this is maybe a controversial one because a lot of people think, do I need to go keto to fall pregnant? Um, and interestingly enough, we actually do have some real, some small studies on keto, but this research in particular showed that it's just about optimizing our quality of carbohydrates. And when you're speaking about, you know, women and people with different, um, you know, health conditions, so things like PCOS and insulin resistance, the carbohydrate quantity also does become important because 
again, I think one of the biggest uh, conditions which impacts ovulatory fertility for women is PCOS and PCOS is highly linked with insulin resistance. So yeah, it's looking at about those, that quality of carbohydrate and quantity as well. So our tip here is, you know, rather than having things like your white bread, your white pasta, your white, uh, you know, flowers, replacing that with the more whole grain alternative. So that could be, you know, multi-grain bread with your breakfast, could be a whole meal pasta. Um, it could be, you know, also including things like other carbohydrates, so your whole fruits and, you know, including those beans as well. So that this can lead to more stable blood sugar levels across the day, um, which helps to manage those insulin levels because we know that, you know, having really erratic and uh, elevated insulin levels can worsen fertility. Now, okay. our next... Yeah, what's to next? Move on. <laughs> Now, our next change is one that a lot of people are really surprised by, and this is actually repl- choosing uh, full fat or whole cow's milk over skim or fat reduced cow's milk. Now, this one I think a lot of people are completely mind boggled because there's so much misinformation at the moment with dairy. Do I cut it all together? Do I use low fat? Do I replace it with something like an almond's milk? But in this research, we know that uh, women who had more whole or full fat milk versus skim milk um, had a reduced time to conception. Um, so again, this, I will kind of pause on this bit of research, um, because I, in, in, in clinical practice, I do kind of tailor this based on each woman and their requirements. So for some people I say, yep, let's do the whole uh, full fat because we know that that's good for ovulatory uh, fertility. For some people, you know, they might have any, you know, so maybe lactose intolerant or they might be vegetarian. So we might say this actually isn't an appropriate swap for you at all. I'm not going to, you know, force you to, to increase that dairy milk if you don't want to. Um, and for some people, skin milk can actually be fine. It's more so depending on other health factors they might have at play um, and just thinking about prioritising that. Yeah. Is it true that skim milk, because they've taken out a lot of the fat, it's got a higher percentage, therefore, of sugars in the milk? Yeah, so great question. I think a big, um, you know, myth is people saying that, you know, there's extra sugar added to lactose. Sorry, it's not to lactose, <laughs> to skim milk. Um, and it's not that there's, they add extra sugar. It's just thinking about purely mm-hmm. from like a volume-based perspective. If we ever do, like, again, a cup of milk has a certain percentage of the naturally occurring sugar in lactose. It has a natural percentage of the, like, again, the fat, which is naturally occurring, and then the proteins. When we're reducing or skimming off that fat, then naturally the volume of lactose or sugar will be slightly higher. I don't think it's a significant factor though. For, again, yeah. skim milk can, or low-fat milk can be completely fine for some people. Like I said, it's just depending on personal um, you know, health priorities. But mm-hmm. from a fertility perspective and obviously fertility, then I think it's, it's a well worth um, consideration of using those full-fat milk and yogurts. Yeah, it's quite interesting. In my 20s, I used to use uh, skim milk. And mm-hmm. then I remember for some reason I had a bottle of full fat, uh, mm-hmm. full fat milk. And I found when I was having my cereal in the morning with the normal milk, mm. I lasted an extra few hours, you know, wow. like I, I didn't find I was hungry by morning tea. So I mm. actually felt fuller for longer just by switching up. So from that point, like it was a mm. great little ex, um, unintentional experiment mm. I did having yep. my cereal with skim milk versus full fat, but then I then I just switched and I, I never went back. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's super interesting. It, it makes sense because fat is, is quite satiating. So if we're having a little bit of extra, you know, the fat in the milk, um, that can certainly, like I said, keep you going for a bit longer. And that's another reason why I think, yeah, it, it makes sense to make this change. But, yeah, from the fertility perspective, it's more so because it has a um, what we call IGF-1, which can help, I guess, with cell growth. So we think it can help encourage ovulation to occur in our, yeah, so, again, pretty interesting. It can be mm. like two birds, one stone there, keep you feeling a bit fuller for longer, more satisfied, and then also help with the, ov- the ovulatory fertility. Yeah, perfect. Okay, and lucky last. Awesome. Yeah, great. So our next one is thinking about including, um, you know, a folate-containing multivitamin. And this is basically what we call a prenatal multivitamin, which, again, we we recommend all women to be taking ideally three months or or longer before they're full pregnant. And the reason why, again, folate is super important is because it it is important or involved in ovulation. So, again, in, in my practice, I rec- again, well, I guess the research encourages all women to, like the NHMRC guidelines, encourages all women to be taking a folate-containing multivitamin and folate and iodine being the bare minimal um, to reduce the risk of things like neural tube defects and other kind of physical and mental 
birth defects. But yeah, so I think, again, this is a key one just to reiterate to women who are trying to conceive it. It's super important to be taking your prenatal multivitamin. In my, in my view, I think everyone, everyone should get their prenatal tailored to their requirements because everyone has a unique requirement. Um, and for example, even just touching on folate, so that this particular research focusing on the folic acid, we know that some women can have higher requirements of folate versus others. So for you know the general guidelines, we recommend 400 micrograms per day. Um, but for women who have certain health conditions such as diabetes or they've previously had a neural tube defect or maybe a family history or maybe they have a higher BMI, we may require up to you know, 10 times more than this baseline 400 micrograms per day. So yeah, it's really important to get that tailored if possible by a dietitian or chatting with your doctor as well. And when you say get it tailored, can you make multivitamins based like with specific dosages? Is that what you mean? Or do you just choose from the um, multivitamins already on the shelf, which Uh would be best? Yeah, yeah, great question. Look, in my in my practice, what I do, and I, again, I help women tailoring their prenatal multivitamin like plans all the time. What I do is basically we have a huge selection of available prenatals on the market beyond just that, you know, one brand that is encouraged, you know, or pushed in, it's in, in pharmacies, right? So we have a really great selection. What I do in terms of tailoring is, again, and it's a really great question. So looking at how do we tailor this? I look at a, a certain, you know, woman's certain health risks. I look at their blood um, vitamin levels. So looking at, um, again, looking at things like their uh, blood levels of vitamin B12 or folate um, other, and then other kind of factors as well. Um, and then also looking at their diet. So how much are they actually are they getting in their diet of things like the folate, the B12, the iron? From there, again, what we do is, you know, we put them on a base, like a baseline prenatal multivitamin and then any additional add-ons which may be required. So that could look like if they have an iron deficiency, plugging that iron gap with an extra iron supplement. It could be if they have a vitamin D deficiency, which again, vitamin D and iron are the biggest deficiencies I see in my practice in a lot of women. Um, maybe, you know, a standard prenatal is not sufficient to help with that deficiency. So we may need some extra things and that's kind of just looking from a nutritional standpoint. But then from a fertility standpoint, there's also a huge variety of fertility promoting supplements, which we may consider based on, again, a a woman's particular health risks, whether it, you know, it's they're going through IVF, whether they're over 35 years old, whether um, they've got PCOS. So yeah, it's basically looking at what's already available and then tailoring a plan to their requirements. Okay. And you mentioned like vitamin B12 and some of those levels. Do you, are you able to test them in the clinic or do you refer them to GP to get a blood test? Yeah. Yeah. Um, great question. So as a dietitian in Australia, we can't actually yeah recommend or request blood tests. So I usually refer them back to their GP um, and, you know, get that, get them to test through their GP. And sometimes I guess with some level of testing, there can be some controversy surrounding it. So if that's the case, I usually, you know, might write them a letter, give them my, my clinical rationale of why I think this test is important for them. Because as you know, at least in Australia, Medicare requirements can be a little bit strict. And aren't there other ways of testing? Are there saliva tests that I know some nutritionists do? Is that? Yeah. So I I would say they're not quite as accurate or valid. So I, in practice as a dietitian, I don't rely on saliva testing. But if there's some testing that, you know, I really want someone to do and maybe their GP is not happy to do it or the client just doesn't have the time to go into their GP, there are alternative testing um, clinics. So we can use, you know, certain clinics which, Again, they're validated labs and they use regular blood testing, but you can go as a self-referral without having to go through your GP. The only thing is you will have to pay out of pocket for that because Medicare won't cover for that. Okay. There you go. You learn something every day. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Definitely, a, again, a big area of contention. Yeah, right. Um, now, can I digress a little bit on the um, on the topic around supplements Mm -hmm. (laughs) and this is not purely for a um, personal reason like (laughs) do you recommend women after they have had babies finish having babies do you reckon that men they still take a supplement of some sort yeah great question I do actually so we know that in particular if a woman is breastfeeding it's really important that they are getting um, iodine through because it comes in through the breast milk to the baby and super important for the baby's again uh, brain development and you know and 
and other kind of health factors as well. So very important for them to continue taking, you know, quote unquote prenatal supplement, but really, you know, there's this, we can definitely continue that postnatal as well. And then there's a, a beyond just that factor of the, you know, health requirements for breast milk. We also know postpartum women can often be quite depleted in a lot of nutrients. Um, they might have had, you know, a huge uh, volume, uh, huge, huge blood loss um, in, in their delivery, and they may have other nutrient deficiencies as well. So even just for their own well-being and looking after themselves and also their energy levels, I do tend to recommend, recommend women to continue a prenatal. But again, just like I said, we like to have it tailored before falling pregnant. I like to say, let's get it tailored all throughout. So preconception, during pregnancy, things change as well. You know, your iron status might change, other um, nutrient levels might change. And postpartum as well, like I like to say, let's let's check in. Let's see where are your blood levels are at and what do you need more of or less of versus during pregnancy? Because as we know, our health requirements do change pretty drastically throughout that whole perinatal period. Mm, yeah, great. Fantastic. So we've gone through the top five tips for for um, diet and nutrition for fertility. Mm-hmm. We've discussed what a dietitian does during pregnancy. Um, we've gone through supplements. Is there anything else that you feel if someone is listening to this podcast episode and either they're trying to conceive or they're thinking about conceiving or perhaps they're newly pregnant or pregnant Mm. is there anything else you would recommend yeah um I guess I would say this is probably more geared towards preconception and fertility is I guess we've spoken a lot today about female fertility um and one thing that I think is really commonly missed is looking at the male factor fertility so we do know that Again, infertility, the shared burden is roughly 50-50 male factor and female factor. Some of it is purely female, some is purely male, and then some is combined factors. And I see this a lot in my clinic. So I would say if you're someone who is, whether you're newly starting with trying to conceive or whether you've been on the fertility journey for a couple couple of years, um, I would definitely encourage you to look at, you know, optimizing diet for both male and female, because again, basically diet and supplementation is supporting the raw material. We're supporting the egg in the female and for a female, we're also supporting ovulation. And in men, we're supporting sperm quality. But the sperm is providing 50% of the DNA. It's just as important. And we know that unfortunately, sometimes it's just not considered until people have been struggling with their fertility for years. Um, and yeah, I guess we spoke a lot about female fertility today, but a lot of these diet changes can actually optimize male fertility as well. So a lot of that, you know, Mediterranean style of eating, very anti-inflammatory um, changes as well. So, you know, lots of those those plant foods, the fruits and veggies, our fish and seafood, lim- uh, minimizing those bad fats as well. So I'd say definitely don't leave that to the last minute and definitely have a bit of a plan um, where possible if you can see a dietitian to work on your diet as as a couple. Mm. But generally speaking, you're saying that these five tips, well, except for the supplement, yeah. um, the, f- the four tips are for the male counterparts too. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess minus the full fat dairy because that's a little, a little bit of contention with, oh, with yep. sperm okay. quality. For, for men, actually, interesting enough, this is very, very niche, but for men with you know improving sperm uh, quality, we know that actually we might recommend low fat milk so and oh. that's purely from a saturated fat perspective yeah a lot of the changes can definitely help with with the male factor as well and even on the supplement point really great question so again we spoke about supplements for females today there are actually supplements that can help support sperm quality as well um and they may look a little bit different to a female prenatal but um they can actually be quite helpful as well so things like you know zinc and folate and coq10 which we haven't spoken about today but there's definitely a whole host of other supplements which can be very beneficial for sperm quality as well just as we spoke with females that we'd recommend having that tailored, I definitely would recommend for any men who want to, yeah, you know, begin on, a, um, I guess, fertility protocol and supporting their fertility, definitely reaching out to a dietitian and getting a tailored supplement plan as well because just like with females, we do want to have things tailored based on, you know, their, cert, their results and their, I guess, their sperm parameters. So do you often see couples rather than just the woman for a consult? Um, I do. I definitely offer both options. In my experience, I think, 
women tend to reach out more than the couple. And sometimes, sometimes I might encourage, say, you know, after having a look at their full fertility history, I might say, hey, how do you feel bringing your part, partner on board? Um, and that is is the mixed bag. You know, some couple, couples are, you know, really keen to for the, part, for the partner to come on board. And sometimes, you know, it just doesn't happen. Or sometimes, it, you know, the, you know, I might see the female and then I say, look, I'm going to share information with my, with my husband or partner. So, yeah, it's, it's a mixed bag. Every I guess there's a different level of, of, of uptake in that regard. Yeah. Now, you have just one other thing I want to go back to. You mentioned this a few times in terms of limiting, um, what do you call it, like the bad fats, air quotation marks. What are your top few foods that you would recommend limiting? Yeah, so I'd probably say when I I speak about bad fats, the biggest player is usually um, a lot of this this takeaway processed foods. So, you know, if you think something like takeaway fried fried chips or chicken, burgers, all of those types of, you know, really processed fast foods, they're very rich in those, I guess, those quote unquote bad fats, because again, for heating, you know, oils to a really high temperature, they're being, they create damage and creating those trans fats. Um, other things that I like to, you know, recommend limiting is, you know, there's, like I said, very, the visible fat or saturated fat that we see on meat. So you're using your lean, if you're using red meat or chicken, using the leaner cuts where possible. And a bit of a controversial one that I think it's worth highlighting because a lot of people think seem to think this is a health food is our coconut fats or coconut oils, a coconut mm-hmm. cream. Because they're often seen as a health food because I mean maybe it's a bit it's it's, it's past this trend, but you know, years ago it was seen as coconut oil is the be all end all of, of healthy fats. But that's actually really, really rich in saturated fats, which is why it's solid um when it's cold. So I would say, you know, if you use coconut uh, fats, you know, really commonly, maybe replacing that out with more of those olive oils and then using that, you know, on occasion just for the flavor. If you really enjoy that coconut fat flavor, the coconut oil. Mm. Is coconut cream worse than coconut milk? Or are you talking mostly about coconut oil? I'd say all, all of the above. So coconut cream, yes, it's going to be a lot denser in the fat compared to coconut milk. So it would be, you know, slightly higher in the saturated fats. Yeah. But yeah, I'd say all of the above. In saying that, if you're using, like, again, just for, for balance sake, if you're using, for the most part, healthy fats like olive oil and maybe rarely, you know, quite rarely you're using a coconut milk and a curry, I don't think that's a big deal. But it's more so we just don't want that to be your go-to everyday fat. Yeah, okay, makes sense. Fantastic. I think I've run out of questions for you, <laughs> Mary. <laughs> great. That's great to hear. So hopefully you've covered most bases here. <laughs> Where can people come and find you? Yeah, sure. So I guess if we're looking at my socials, you can find me at on Instagram at Tayyib Nutrition, T-A-Y-Y-I-B Nutrition. Um, and then if you're interested in looking at consults, you can book in online. So I've had my website is www.tayyib, again, same spelling, and I'm sure you provide that in the, in the show notes, yep, nutrition.com.au. Sure. So that's my best place to find me. And um, I guess any questions I'm more than happy to take if you want to reach out on Instagram, connect through there, or even on my email. So email is um, hello at tayyibnutrition.com.au. And just putting you on yes. the spot here, send any sure. Um, questions because then we could jump on a live, a quick Instagram yeah. live to answer anyone's questions. So oh, um, feel free to send great. either <laughs> of us a DM and then we can jump on an Instagram live. Oh, love that. Love that, Catherine. <laughs> Always okay, happens to live. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's been, yeah, a great to, I think this topic, it's one of those things, it's always good to have a reminder yeah, like you just yeah. a bit of a refresh because you do tend to fall into your habits quite quickly. Yeah. It's the same with exercise and motivation. Like you can, you, you keep needing, we, we need to keep the touching prompts. base on it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, Catherine. I've had a lovely time chatting today and look forward to, yeah, again, any future lives or any future um, options that we can speak again. Yeah, fantastic. Speak to you soon. Take care. Bye. And before I sign off, my team and I will be putting together the show notes for this episode with all the links, including how to connect with Mariam at fitnessmama.com forward slash podcast. And don't forget to send myself and Mariam a DM on Instagram. If you've got any questions about your fertility diet, just send us a DM. We would love to hear from you. You can find me at Fitness Mama, F I T N E S T M A M A. 
Have a fabulous day, everyone, and I look forward to you joining me very soon for another episode of the Pregnancy, Birth and Recovery podcast. Thanks for listening to the Fitness Mama podcast brought to you by the Fitness Mama freebies found at www.fitnessmama.com forward slash free. So please take a few seconds to leave a review, subscribe so you don't miss an episode and be sure to take a screenshot of this podcast, upload it to your social media and tag me at Fitness Mama so I can give you a shout out too. Until next time, remember, an active pregnancy, confident childbirth and strong postnatal recovery is something that you deserve. Remember our disclaimer, materials and contents in this podcast are intended as general information only and shouldn't substitute any medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. I'll see you soon.